Do you think 2024 is the year that Europe starts to outpace the US in terms of growth if Germany can get that right? Hey, everyone. Welcome to our latest TDR Cannabis exclusive Big Cop uh, podcast here this morning as we welcome in. He is the chairman of the largest cannabis company in the world, which begins trading on the TSX under the ticker symbol C-U-R-A, chairman of Cureleaf, Boris Jordan. Back to the podcast. Been a while, but great to have you back on. How are you? I'm great. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So uh, I guess let's just cut to the chase. Obviously, big news everyone's talking about. You've uplisted on the TSX. Uh, trading begins on December 14th, which is today by the time this podcast goes out. So it's a big day for the company, to say the least. Go ahead. So you're going to come. I want to correct that. Uh, it's important to correct it. It starts trading tomorrow morning, tomorrow. not today. Tomorrow, right. So today we get today we get delisted from the CSE uh, after the close. And tomorrow we start trading on the TSX. Correct. Um, so what this, I guess, in your own words, what's this mean for the company moving forward? So I think it's a positive, not only for the company, obviously, primarily for the company, but for the sector. It's a it's a um, it's it's a lift to a more uh, senior exchange. Uh, it's an exchange that has you know market makers, an exchange that has a lot more liquidity. There's a lot more access, and more importantly, um, a lot of the large money center uh, U.S. custodians have agreed to custody and prime uh, stocks, U.S. cannabis stocks that trade in the TSX. Uh, largely given the extensive background checks yep. and due diligence that the TSX does uh, is enough for a lot of these major banks uh, to uh, then uh, custody and prime. So what that does is if you, if you go back, you know, five years to when we went public, uh, you know, 96 percent of our offering was large institutional investors. Yep. Uh, only four percent was retail. Today, we're almost 100 percent retail. Let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so what that will do, not not day one, but over, say, a six to 12 month period, it will allow us to start re-educating and marketing large investors, long only large hedge funds on the sector, on Cureleaf, and it will bring about more liquidity and a lot more stability to the share price. It will also allow us to be hopefully allowed to uh, be included in three of the largest uh, um, uh, uh, global uh, indexes. Right. So, uh, you know, the MSCI, the FTSE and the TMX, those are three indices that if we can get to be a part of now, there's no guarantee, but we meet most of the criteria. So we think we should be able to get into them. That will, will bring more long term money into the cap structure, which will cement and give a foundation to those to the prices. Times are changing, aren't they? So needless to say, based off that feedback, Times are changing. Are, are you like when you look like we've had a lot of discussions in some of our podcasts recently, but how do you feel about this industry going into 2024? Listen, I, I, I'm going to start by saying this has been a very hard industry. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think one needs to recognize that um, it's it's certainly taken more uh, time to reform it and to get the federal government, particularly in the U.S., to address a lot of the issues than we all thought. Yeah. Uh, but I'm positive on 24. Um, I'm positive first and foremost because I think all the cannabis companies have done a huge amount of work uh, to clean up their balance sheets, to clean up their costs, to get themselves right-sized going into 2024. So 23 was a year of adjustment in the sector. It was a year we all knew wouldn't have a tremendous amount of growth <laughs> due to the not, not having a lot of catalysts available in 23. So it was a year that most of the industry used to right-size their businesses. And we go into 24 where... We're right-sized. We feel very good about our balance sheets, our cash flows. But more importantly, we now have pretty substantial growth catalysts yeah. that we're seeing. Yeah. And, you know, obviously New York was a huge one for us. Huge. Uh, Germany, what we expect in April is another big one from Cureleaf. Obviously, Ohio at the end of next year. And then obviously Florida, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, ballots coming up. We think those are probably 25 uh, 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 catalysts. So 24 and 25, in my opinion should be a return to growth is what I would call it for the cannabis sector. Well said. So, I mean, as far as, as, as far as growth goes, I mean, I know you made that transformational acquisition of EMAC in 2021 um, to really turn Cureleaf into a global cannabis business. I mean, do you think 2024 is the year that Europe starts to outpace the U S in terms of growth? If Germany can get that right. Well, listen, it's already outpacing by a mile. Hmm. I mean, we're okay. growing, we're growing, you know, uh, 
in the last three years, uh, since we bought the business, two and a half years, we've grown, you know, the first couple of years we were growing at four or 500%, obviously of low numbers. But yeah. even this year, now that we're getting, you know, we're growing over 130% this year, we're expecting to grow over 100% next year, but now we're getting to real numbers, right? That this business next year is going to do well over 100 million euros of revenue. So we're wow. really starting to pick a pace in Europe. We just added Poland as a major market for us. And, and, and the important thing about Europe has been that unlike the United States, you can't just build a facility, open your doors and start selling, right? Mm -hmm. This is a medical, very strict, almost pharmaceutical type market where it takes over a year to register a strain of cannabis, um, over a year to get all the different approvals over, you know, so you have to be EU GMP certified. So these facilities are much more advanced than anything we have in the United States. So these are things that you have to put in place in Europe. And that's why it was important to get in early because anyone coming in now, it's just going to take them that much longer to get into the marketplace than purely. So we're now, as I said, we're selling in Poland, in Germany, in Switzerland, and in the UK. And all of those markets are growing at over 100% annualized for us. And now we're getting into real numbers starting next year. Like this year, we'll mm. finish around $65 million dollars. But when we go into next year, we're starting to see real pickups. So as I always said, I feel that 26, 27, we're looking at, you know, a business that's doing, you know, half a billion to a billion dollars potentially in, yeah. in the European market wow. for us. So we're getting close, you know, by 26, 27 to where the U.S. market is for us today. So we're pretty pleased with that. Interesting. Product. Speaking speaking about those stringent regulations that you do see in Europe, I mean, we've seen we've heard a lot of conjecture around schedule two, schedule three. Um, do you see any sort of, I guess, ev evolution of the US market having to meet what you're seeing in Europe? Or you think that we continue operating in the framework that we've been operating, we get descheduling, and you don't really see us going to like a true pharma model? Um, I don't, I don't think production. we go to a pharma. Yeah, I don't think the US goes to a pharma model. Listen, I could be wrong on this, but I don't think so. I think the genie's out of the bottle in the US and we're going more yeah. towards a adult use recreational consumer product model. Now, yeah. don't get me wrong. I think that once we get rescheduling, the DEA and the FDA will opine on the sector and there'll be rules and regulations. There'll be THC caps for different products. There'll be flavor uh, restrictions. A lot of the things that protect minors and other people will be put in place. So that will add a level of complexity to the sector. Uh, yeah. But it, frankly, it's needed. Uh, and I think it's a good thing because what's going on today is just anarchy. Um, I was really happy to see the FDA uh, uh, yesterday, you know, um, put uh, a, a lot of these synthetic uh, cannabinoids on the, sec on, uh, on the uh, restricted list. Um, and that's a good thing because some of these things that are coming out of China um, are really dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're almost hallucinogenic and, and yeah. they don't belong in cannabis products, uh, certainly not in ones sold uh, freely on the street. And so I'm a big supporter of adding a level of regulation. Now, that's a double edged sword, as we all know. Yeah. Governments tend to overreach, uh, but then the, over time, they also tend to li li liberalize. So I think it's a it's a it's a. It's a happy medium. I, th I think the sector needs to grow up and sit down with the FDA and the DA and have a have an adult conversation on how we move this business forward. But this free for all we have in the U.S. is probably something that needs to be controlled for really for the consumer safety. I know the consumers are screaming yell after this uh, podcast that you know Jordan's trying to regulate or stop. But I, I'm telling you, I think it's a good thing for safety. I mean, you guys probably remember the stories post prohibition you know, gin that was making people go blind yeah. and people were dying from moonshine and stuff like that. We, we can't have that. We don't want that in cannabis. Well, a lot of conversation. We, we want to keep it as a safe product. A lot of conversation we've had recently. It's about safe product, knowing where you're going, where you're getting it from. Like, for example, one of the companies we spoke to actually went into a black market dispensary, a mother multi-state operator in Manhattan. Place was raided. And the store owner said, be right back, came back out two minutes later with a garbage bag and said, you know, what is it you want? And I'm like, this is seriously happening in this space right now. Like, yeah. so clearly we're in a day and an age where, you know, outside of cannabis, there's a ton of people that, uh, needless to say, uh, they want to know where their product's coming from. You'd mentioned Poland, uh, maybe educate some of our viewers on how that whole opportunity came to fruition. And are they a lot further ahead compared to say other European countries? 
so Poland is basically following the German model of medical uh, cannabis, uh, using a lot of the very similar regulations that Germany has in terms of registrate strains and product. And, and frankly, we got a little bit lucky there in that, that we, we have a supply chain that had products that were that were registered in Germany and Poland accepted those registrations. Ah, okay. uh, and so we were able to get into that market um, pretty quickly. And now uh, we are looking to expand our presence. We, we are probably going to go domestic. So at the moment, we're just importing. But we are looking to, to become a domestic operator in Poland. As a matter of fact, we're in discussions with, with, with a bunch of operators there. Because we, it's listen, it's a 60 million population. It's a population that we see likes cannabis as an alternative yeah. to um, uh, pain, other pain products. And so we are very, very excited about it. We, you know, we expect to do, you know, multiple millions of dollars of revenue in Poland next year. It's a nice increase off of this year, like three, four, five hundred percent. So we only entered the market in the second half of this year. But, you know, our products are in high demand. Huh. We can't produce them fast enough to sell them. 60 million in Poland. I didn't realize there's that kind of. No, no, I said, I said, no, we did 65 million in Europe, 60 million citizens. You're right. In Poland. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. I was just like, I yeah, didn't it's, 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 yeah, I, I, it's keeps changing because of the influx of Ukrainians into Poland. So yeah, the number goes up and down depending. I, I think the original population was something like around fifty, but there's been like nine million or ten million Poles, uh, Ukrainians that have you know, left Ukraine, and a lot of them are in Poland. Yeah, makes sense. In terms of branding in the EU, I mean, is Select a brand that you're selling through there? And I mean, I know we saw 2023 was kind of like I don't want to call it a resurgence, but we really saw an emphasis on scaling the select brand in product offerings and especially in the US. I mean, is the strategy to create to turn select into a global brand um, yeah, under so the Curly portfolio? Select is definitely our global brand that we're going to be moving into. So we are starting to sell Curaleaf uh, products in the UK. Uh, okay. We are about to have Curaleaf products also sold in in Germany. Our main uh, brand in Europe is 420. Uh, it's okay. the company that we acquired in uh, in in Germany, so we are using that as our high end brand. But for instance, our vapes, our edibles, all these products are going in under Select. 420 is our high end flower brand, kind of like Grassroots is in the U.S. 420 is in Europe, and then Cureleaf is going to be the mid tier cannabis uh, flower brand, and Select is all of the edible products and vape products and things like that is going to be there and. Uh, uh, at the moment, into into, uh, into Poland, we're selling 420 because that's the brand that was registered okay. um, uh, in Germany. And so it takes a long time to register a brand. And so we're selling under the 420 brand into Poland at the moment. Are those the brands that you're going to lead in the wholesale market based on last week's news in New York? Yeah, I think that uh, in in, uh, in, United, in in New York, obviously, we're going with all of our brands. So, you know, our our, our, our Select brand, our Jams brand, our, our Cureleaf, our Grassroots brand. But in Europe, it's slightly different because it's they don't allow some of these brands like grassroots would never be allowed. It's, it's seen as not a pharmaceutical name. So you have to be more pharmaceutical there. So they're allowing certain brands they are not allowing others. What do you think of that announcement? I'm sure that was welcoming news. Listen, you know, we, I've been involved in that New York situation from, from the start. And we led, you know, the, the unfortunate um, uh, conflict with the regulator. But it had we're it's unfortunate it had to come to that. But the. New York regulator was, you know, did not want uh, the ROs in the industry for a long time. Yeah. So we had to we had to go to court, unfortunately. But we're glad that the the court, you know, basically sided with with our position, and so we were able to reach a settlement with 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 the state. Uh, and the state has since then been cooperating with us. And so, mm. you know, I'm I'm I, I don't hold grudges. I just want to put it behind us. I want to show New York State that we're we're good operators like we were in the medical space. We've yep. been there for 10 years and, and the largest operator in the state. We want to be the same uh, in the adult use market. You, so Boris, put you, it behind us and go forward. What do you think's changed besides the obvious with people now listing in New York? Is it just the rollout's just been, it is what it is. And it's come to the point now where like they know they need to change. I think there's two things. I think, first of all, there was a there was a fundamental issue of law. Um, there was violations of the law that was you know done by the regulator. And secondly, um, I think that yes, I think the rollout was very 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 slow. I understand what they were trying to do with the rollout, and I'm absolutely for helping underprivileged communities and people the hurt in the war on drugs to get into the sector. We do this everywhere, but the, 
I don't understand limiting us from getting in the market because we're actually an instrument of helping that happen, right? Yeah. We can finance these stores. We can give them terms on products. We can help them with loans. There's a numerous things we can do, and we're doing that in other states. But New York didn't want us doing that. They just wanted to limit us for getting into the sector, and I thought that was a mistake. Um, but that's behind us now. Listen, I think I, I don't even want to talk about the past problems. I want to talk about how we go forward. Good for you. I think we have an agreement with the state. I think we have an agreement with the with the card licenses. We are already delivering. We we made our first shipment. I think two days ago, we are now in the market selling our products on a wholesale basis. CureLeaf has, you know, all of our facilities were built out, we were ready to go. And now we're in a position to hopefully capitalize on that investment we made, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, that, you know, we can now capitalize on and, and, and start to sell our products across the state. That's great. Speaking of going, speaking of going forward, I mean, obviously, the, the wholesale activation comes first. I mean, what's the retail approach to Colo? adult use on the medical? Is that going to be a wait and see approach and see how the market starts to evolve? And then we we'll only have, the we only allowed three stores. So for cure relief yeah. on the call, it's not going to be a, a retail is not going to be our business in New York. It's really okay. a place that we can show off our products um, uh, uh, to the marketplace. Um, and also they're going to be sort of stores that are, you know, they're going to be quite nice stores that are going to really show everything that cure relief does. It'll also be a place that uh, our wholesale customers can come to see all of our different products so that we can show it to them. But really, New York is about wholesale, right? It, it's more okay. traditional PPG, where we're going to be pushing product out to all of the different stores. I suspect there'll be over a thousand stores in New York in two, three years. Okay. Uh, and I think that, you know, legal stores, I think a lot of the illegal operators in New York City are going to be switching over to legal licenses uh, in order to open up because there's going to be pressure on them. We're already seeing the pressure building. Uh, and it's not only pressure from the regulatory authorities, it's also pressure just from the legal market, right? Yeah. If you can go into a store and buy a legal product that's safe and tested, why would you ever go to a store that doesn't do that? And oh, the word is going to spread very quickly. And I think that that will help the, the legal market really put pressure on them. And hopefully a lot of these illegal guys, I've got no issue with them. The more the merrier. Hopefully they switch over to legal um, uh, stores and and. Be, and become uh, competitive, and and we can sell them product. That's the way we look at yeah. it. Yeah, I know. And speaking about speaking about another high impact market you're in. I mean, I know you have quite a big presence in Florida. I mean, you guys are currently fourth in the OMU numbers. Um, how high of an impact do you think the adult use flip in Florida could be on Cure Relief's business? So I, I want to correct you on the OMU numbers. We're number two. Um, we had one week, one week uh, after the holidays that we dropped. Uh, 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 a couple hours, but we're always number two in Florida, just to make sure okay. that we're uh, on the same page okay. on that one. Uh, um, uh, but uh, listen, Florida's a massive, I mean, Florida's a 200 million plus market for us. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, w with adult use coming, which we hope it will, again, there's no guarantees, you know, that's going to double at a minimum. Um, yeah. You know, it could go more because we're not factoring in um, uh, uh, um, uh, tourist traffic. It's very difficult to model tourist traffic for us. And so um, we haven't factored that in, but certainly on the base of the current population and what we've seen in other markets, that's easily a double um, uh, in, in Florida for us. So, you're, you know, you're talking about a market that's getting close to a half a billion dollars for Cure Leaf alone. Yeah. That's a real business. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a significant presence for us. And welcoming news from last month regarding Ohio as well. That's going to be a big market for you guys, right? We're super excited about Ohio. Um, you know, we're opening up. We're already negotiating leases on stores. Uh, you know, I think that this um, effort by the uh, by the government to try and scale back the program, you know, it obviously currently has failed because the program has been launched officially. You know, the date was, I think, December 7th or whatever it was that, that moved forward. Now, they can try to legislate certain aspects away, but I, I think that they'll, at least what we saw from the Senate, they're trying to be reasonable in it. I don't yeah. think they want to go ahead. They don't think they want to go uh, um, against the will of the people. And certainly the House, the Senate is more aggressive. The House certainly doesn't. So yeah. I think we should be okay. Uh, there may be some changes, but I think there'll be ones that this, the industry can live with and they'll probably be around some kind of, you know, restrictions on, on cannabis sales going to minors, yeah. which is we all support anyway. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was sensible. It was sensible. They kept home grow. They want to restrict, restrict and come down on sales to minors and then public yeah. consumption. Which I mean are things that I'm fully for. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I I'm with you on the same thing. And I just yeah. think as long as they don't overtax it so that 
they make the illicit market, you know, flourish in that estate, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Do you see, speaking of taxes, I mean, do you see an excise tax coming down once 280E is abolished from the, oh, yeah. from, from the, from the structure of the business? Come on, man. You, yeah. you, honestly, you think the guys in Washington aren't going to try every chance they do to raise money in the United States, they use. So yeah. uh, yes, absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt in my mind, as a matter of fact, the way I think it works. And, and I want to clarify something that was misrepresented um, uh, on a previous talk I did recently. My view has been from the beginning that I believe that the rescheduling is going to take place uh, by April yeah. um, uh, and not um, uh, this year. And I've been saying that from day one of this rescheduling right. conversation. Yeah. Someone took uh, something I, I said out of context. Uh, and thought it was I thought it was going to happen the next couple of days. I, I've always been uh, uh, saying that I don't believe this will happen in December, that I think it'll happen closer to April because it's a political issue and they want to run on it. But they do have some restrictions. They've got a 60 day uh, uh, period for comments and then they have a 60 day legislative period in order to make it irreversible. So that really runs uh, right into March into sorry, into November. Um, so the latest date they can do it basically is October, uh, April 20th. And I personally think they might try to do that. So, you know, to do something. it around a big event like 420 and have the president and the other people come out and speak about it. Uh, and so you I've always that, said that I think it's it's going to be around April. You think that could happen? President comes out on April 20th? I, I think it could happen. I, now, listen, there's, they could come out and, and make the recommendation now and then, and then have the common period and then actually launch it on 420. Or they can come out and, and actually make the recommendation on 420. The problem with making the recommendation on 420 is, is that they literally go almost to the day of the election. Yeah. yeah. Because they need 60-day comment, and then they need 60 days. Plus, after the comment period, presumably, you want to make changes based on the comments to the rules. And 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 so they, they may not have enough time. So it yeah. could come a little bit earlier than 420, but I think they want to do something – PR wise, because listen, I ran one campaign in my life for a congressman, and I can tell you that what you do is you want to run big news as close to the election as you possibly can. Yeah, and and they're looking to try and attract the young vote. This is a young vote issue, and I think they're going to try and come as close as they can to the to the election rather than right now. Well, as you said, you like to think about things moving ahead, the future. If that rescheduling were to happen, let's say in April, what's this do besides the obvious with regards to the industry? Like how much of an opportunity and a turning point would this be for the cannabis industry? You know, listen, that is the, that is the single most important piece of regulation slash legislation, even though it's more regulation that this industry needs, yep. right? Let's be honest, safe banking, all the other things are nowhere near. So, uh, what's crippling this industry is that this industry largely works for the federal government. Yeah. Every do extra dime that we have, and th there's not a lot of it, goes to the federal government mm -hmm. in taxes. So, um, and it's a tax rate that no one else except the cannabis industry pays in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it is absolutely discriminatory. It is practically unconstitutional. And some people are making a case on that issue. Um, uh, and so we need to remove it. And it is going to have a dramatic impact. I can't speak to the other companies, but I've spoken many times for CureLeaf. That's one hundred and fifty to two hundred million dollar drop to the bottom line of cash flow and net income day one. So it's a big number. I mean, Huge. let's be honest that 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 transforms our business overnight, and it makes us a healthier, better company, better balance sheet. You know, we can expand. We can our cost of capital drops probably pretty dramatically on the back of that. So this is an important thing, and I think it's something that. I think Washington's understanding they can't keep going with this discriminatory. There's lawsuits being filed. There's 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 frustration at the state level. So I think this happens, but I don't think they're going to rush it because I think they want to do it right. But the one good piece of news is that all of our lawyers that we have extensive amounts working on this in D.C. Yeah. After the um, uh, Freedom of Information Act came out, you know, the document came about the HSS document came back to us four or five days later after reviewing it. Now, obviously, a lot was redacted, yeah. but they came back to us and said that what wasn't redacted is certainly showing that the federal government is moving towards Schedule 3. So, Brett, so that's the really, really good news that we got. Again, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a regulator. I'm just paraphrasing what they told me. 
I got like four calls late Friday night after markets closed from all the people that, that we have working for us on this. They all came back with this absolutely the same view. What we're seeing now is very positive. Yeah. Agreed. That's I mean, Boris, you, you're you, you're one of the OGs in the MSO space. I mean, you took controlling interest to Cureleaf 2015. Your institutional background is from an investment perspective. I mean, I'm assuming you look out before making moves. When you set out and took control of Cureleaf in 2015, did you think that we'd be here today in terms of the industry progressing and regulations? Or did you think we'd be past this um, yeah, as far I, as that I goes? I definitely thought that we would have moved faster on some aspects of the regulation. Um, yeah. I didn't think, I never thought that we'd have interstate commerce or anything like that at this point in time. I always said that was a 10 plus year out thing, although we're, we're fast approaching we're coming, 10 years we're, now. We're coming up on that, yeah. Because <laughs> um, uh, my first investment in the sector was actually, I made my first investment in Palliatech, which is now Cureleaf back in 2014. Um, but, um, so we're getting close to the 10 years, but I certainly felt that we were going to have more uh, regulation, uh, uh, you know, more federal uh, laws already out that would give some kind of framework for the sector. Yeah. I didn't think that we'd have this 280E thing here still at this point in time. So, yes, I'm definitely disappointed with <coughs> our regulators. Um, the one thing this has taught me a lot, because I, you know, I'm an, I was born and raised in this country, but I left to go to Europe back in the uh, um, when I got out of, uh, I worked on Wall Street for a few years and then I went to Europe to work. And um, when I came back, one thing I realized is that, you know, we may be a democracy, but frankly, uh, the people in Washington don't give a shit what the people, uh, the voters think, right? Because Correct. this thing polls so high. Yeah. And frankly, every time I go to D.C. and I speak to our legislators, I'm shocked with the indifference to what, uh, how they treat the voter in this country. They don't give a shit. Right. Yeah. It's it's their government. It's the way they're going to run it. And they don't care what we think. And it's all about special interests. And the special interests have a lot more money than the cannabis sector does now. Yeah. Um, and they're lobbying actively. I mean, how, you know, we could sell fentanyl and, 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 and opiates over the counter and have doctors prescribing not cannabis is just outrageous. I mean, yeah. it's literally outrageous. I mean, you know, it's everyone in Europe has understood this. Everyone. But nobody gets it in the United States still. So it just shows you the power of our pharmaceutical industry and hopefully that that will change over time. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely disappointed with the progress that we've made in the United States, but you know, I'm a half full kind of guy, glass half full. Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've operated in emerging markets where things were just as gloomy as this Yeah. Uh, at times. And then all of a sudden, you know, you wake up one morning and all these stocks are up five times and you know somebody's yeah. made a decision things have changed and so i'm a firm believer that the key message to investors in this business is that these companies are getting stronger every year growing every year yeah. becoming more efficient every year and our market caps have only gone down and that is a yeah. massive opportunity yeah i don't care how you look at it i've never seen anything like this except maybe in the 1990s in russia where you had these massive oil companies and natural resource companies that were trading at a fraction of what Exxon and everybody was trading at. And it was all because there was bad lawmaking, there weren't any rules, it was the wild, wild west. And then all of a sudden, you wake up one morning and everybody realizes, holy shit, we need to own this stuff and everything's up 20 times, right? And so I've seen the frustration over a longer, like almost a, almost as long as cannabis, almost 10 years it took until the world realized, Jesus Christ, we need to own these assets. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think we're, you know, one thing that uh, George Soros once told me in a private conversation when I was super excited about emerging markets and I was managing money for him and he said to me, Boris, he goes, the largest emerging market is in the United States. We have the only market in the world where we have new industries, emerging industries growing at 25% plus on an annualized basis, we have the largest capital market and we have a legal system that actually protects your rights. He goes, so this is the largest, most interesting emerging market. And he was dead right. Yeah. Um, you know, why invest in a market where, where you know, you could have your asset taken away tomorrow or there's going to be a war that has sanctioned. You can invest in a country where we have a great legal system. We got more capital 
uh, more access to capital yeah. and the best you know, opportunities in the world. And yes, some of that is still a problem for cannabis, but that also presents an opportunity. Where else could I build a multi-billion dollar business like this in a developed market like this? If, if, if the entries, the barriers to entry weren't high, I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. It's yeah. Well said. I think that pretty much wraps it up, but I know you've been a big advocate for this industry and whether you wanted to accept this role or not, but you've been kind of the face of this industry from an executive standpoint. Um, but giving a lot of those examples, it, it feels like we're at that tipping point right now uh, with the industry heading into uh, this year. But uh, it'd be interesting to see how things unfold. But hopefully we wake up one morning like that uh, example used in Russia and these stocks are up five times, right? I'm hopeful. I think we all are. But uh, guys, thanks for having me. And I'm, I am cautiously optimistic and positive going into 24 and 25. Yeah. I think this industry is turning a corner, and I think that's good news. It's great to know. Yeah. Boris, appreciate Thank you for your time. time. Let's keep in touch, Thanks, okay? Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. We appreciate all your feedback. So if you want to leave some comments, let us know what you think and what you want to learn of. Subscribe to our channel by clicking here. If you want to see more videos like this, then click here, because at the end of the day, we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.